I'm Beverly Allen, and I'm the president of the Torch of Wisdom Foundation, and I want to welcome you here to get today. We are so delighted that you have joined us, those of you in the room with us, as well as those of you who have joined us virtually. We're very excited. This is our fifth annual 
Art Extravaganza, which is a collaboration between the Torch of Wisdom Foundation and the Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club. So we're very excited about it. This is our, this is our kickoff. We kick off always with an educational seminar, and today we have an exciting panel for you today. We're um, uh, excited to bring to you more information about how you uh, collect art, how you preserve your art, how you protect your art, all the things that you want to know about either starting your art collection or protecting the one that you've already started. So this morning I'd like to, or this afternoon, I'd like to introduce you to Drake Pfeiffer, who is a board member of the Torch of Wisdom Foundation. Drake uh, joined our board. He's He's been a long time supporter of the Torch of Wisdom Foundation, but we were very, very, very excited to welcome and have him join the board in 2021 because he offers so much energy and passion and ideas. And so I'll turn it over to Drake so that he can introduce the panel to you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. And thank you everyone for uh, joining us this afternoon. There's a million things you could be doing, but um, other things you could be doing, but you have shown your, your passion for the arts by being here today. And uh, before I introduce our panelists, I'd just like to say, that in this fifth year of this event, I'm I'm extremely uh, excited to say I, I think that this event has grown legs. It has grown uh, year over year very successfully, and it is uh, evidence of uh, uh, an art collection and artist ecosystem in uh, Detroit and southeastern Michigan that I think. Uh, is unlike any other, and I think that this art seminar underscores uh, that difference. And and I think once we talk to our panelists, we're gonna. Anyway, I know it's just, we're preaching to the choir. Many of you who are already are here today, but I think we're gonna understand even better why uh, art collecting is so important and what it means to uh, all of us here in this community. And I'm gonna open up, I think, I'll start with you, Henry, and go down to you, Catherine, only because you have a presentation that you're gonna make after everybody's done. So we'll go, I'll go from this way to this way. And Tracy, thank you for joining uh, us at the panel. We have Henry Harper, who is uh, the uh, founder of Harper uh, Galleries on uh, Detroit's east side on West East Grand Boulevard. East Grand Boulevard. Uh, he is a, a very storied uh, antique and arts dealer in the city, and 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 Henry is a, a, a wonderful resource for anyone who is beginning their journey uh, as an artist or an art collector. Uh, we have uh, Tracy Williams, uh, formerly of the Charles H. Wright Museum, my former uh, employer. Uh, and also my current employer, uh, the Oakland County Economic Development Team. Tracy has uh, been pulled in to uh, share her knowledge of, on our collecting as well. And uh, next to her is Aaron Wilborn. And Aaron, I'm not gonna read your whole bio. I'm gonna let you, it, it's quite impressive, but I, I'm gonna let you get into exactly what that is. But uh, Aaron is the client executive for Highland and and thank you Highland for these wonderful bags that you've left on the chairs of the guests who are arriving today. Uh, I don't know what's in them, but I want to get one because I don't want to miss out on what it what is in them. <laughs> and uh, and then finally, Catherine. Catherine is a senior client service manager and team lead at Highland. And uh, both Aaron and Catherine are going to discuss the importance of ensuring uh, one's artwork and how to go about that. And so uh, without further ado, Catherine, I'll let you take the mic and go go forward with your uh, presentation and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get it started. Okay. Can everyone hear me? All right, how's that work? How about our screen here? Wait for our screen. 
So first, I would like to say thank you very much. You can come up. One moment, please. Thank you to Mr. Harper and the whole team here at Torch of Wisdom. We are um, very excited and honored to be here speaking with everybody today about insurance. Let's see if we can get this up here real quick. All right, there we go. We're on. Okay, so um, as mentioned, there's some gift bags there for you. And at the end of the event today, we have a couple drawings for some gift baskets at the back. So if you would, when you have some time, complete the worksheet that's in your bags, and then we'll do a drawing at the end. So I'm Catherine, as mentioned. I have worked in the insurance industry over 25 years, and I love all of the nitty gritty things about insurance. Not generally what everybody loves, but those are the things I love. Aaron is my partner. He's going to share some things with you about his background and why he loves insurance. So we work for Highland. Highland is an insurance agency that has offices across the United States, and we also have partners overseas and in multiple countries. Our job as insurance agents and in working to support the agency is to know the insurance marketplace, what's happening with trends and things that are going on. We're also responsible for knowing about the individual insurance companies and their policy forms, because it's really their policy forms that determines what happens at a time of loss. And then finally, we need to get to know our clients and you. You all have unique needs with respect to your collections, with respect to the way um, that you live your life, your businesses, all of those things. So we need to understand what those things are so that we can provide products for you that are going to meet your needs and essentially make you whole at the time of loss. So today, just at a really high level, we're going to talk about insurance policies for collections and art because it's different what we need to do on an insurance policy for art and collections than insuring our, our regular household items. And then Aaron's going to talk about selecting a trusted advisor. So the art world and the collections world is really growing. We're seeing new artists emerge. We're seeing different types of mediums being used. So things like hair, human hair, and gum, and blood, things that were never used in the past are being used now. And that's presented some interesting challenges in the insurance industry when it comes to valuing art, try to protect art, and putting you whole, essentially, once something has happened. The other thing that's happening is that we're finding as collectors start, their collections are evolving. So not only is it just art, sometimes now it's cars, or jewelry, or watches, or furs. So there's all different types of collections out there. And again, how those are insured matters. In addition to the medium changing, people are purchasing their art in different ways now. Many people are using online auctions and galleries. Some people are stepping up and taking art, purchasing without basically seeing it. It's sight unseen. And then in addition, we have a younger generation that's highly influenced by social media and is also purchasing art through social media. So we take all of those things into account and then also look at the collectors. And there's two main ways that we see collectors um, kind of focus. One is from an emotional perspective. They're interested in what it is they're purchasing. They're excited. It brings them pleasure. And the other part of it is for, for a financial gain and interest. Right? This is an investment long term. Investors want their money back. So this little uh, chart shows a little bit about kind of the spread and the difference. Really collecting art, we see a lot for investment, which is even more important why we ensure that a policy is right for a collector. So does anybody have any idea what the most common type of claim is filed on, an, on a, a collection or for art? Anybody have any ideas? I think I know. <laughs> Okay, what would that be? Hole punctures. <laughs> Hole punctures. Well, that's definitely part. It's accidental situations and breakage. So more than 60% of claims that are happening in collections comes from those things. But it's not limited there. There's other areas that are being impacted, water damage, fire, all of those types of things. When we look at what happens in day-to-day -day life, if you can think of yourself or your families or friends, collectors that you know, 
think of something happen to um, one, one item in their set. Could be jewelry, could be paintings, could be whatever it is. What about a child or a dog running through and something goes flying through the air and it hits the artwork? Sometimes candles are burning and there's a flicker that's unexpected, right? There's lots of different things that can happen in just our day-to-day -day life that we don't necessarily think about. And those things can have a significant impact on your art. If we purchased a regular policy, it would only respond to items on a replacement cost basis, which basically means it replaces what that item is with depreciation to bring you basically back to whole. So like, kind, or quality. Well, in the collection space, sometimes there is no like, kind, or quality. The other way it's adjusted on a standard policy is by actual cash value. Well, you may purchase something that may significantly increase or significantly decrease in value, but at the time of claim, if you have a regular policy, that's not going to pay. It's going to pay the, the lesser amount of what that item is. So we want to make sure that you're insured properly. So we see two common ways that collections are insured. Sometimes with newer collectors, a homeowner's policy is okay if it's endorsed for a collection. Homeowner's policies are really designed to insure lower values, things that don't move around much, so stay in one location or one home. They don't have catastrophic coverage, so if you live in an earthquake or a hurricane zone, that might not be the most appropriate. But if you have small limits, small values, you're not concerned about the art changing much in value, homeowner's policy may be okay. However, when, you're, when your collection starts growing and expanding, then we really look to a collector's policy. So collections really are viewed by insurance companies as being something special and unique. You created the collection, it's unique to you. There's no collection that looks like another. So it's important that the insurance company then is able to look at your art, look at your collection, and make decisions at time of claim. So if you're in an earthquake zone, if you're having a, a wind situation, if your power goes out, if something happens, the goal is to make sure that the insurance policy responds to the value of your art, not what you paid for it, not if it decreased in value, but to break, make, bring you whole. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so there's two different methods that insurance companies look at when they're looking at your collection. The first way they look at them is from a scheduled basis. So they'll ask you for a list of your collection, every single item they want noted, and they want the value for every item noted. The other way is to look at your collections as a whole. So it could have multiple different types of mediums in there, but they'll look at that as a whole and they'll say, I'm gonna value this, let's say at a million dollars. But instead of you having to give that itemized list, they will give you a limit per item, maximum limit per item. So if something catastrophic happened and your whole collection went, you'd have that million dollars. But if one item was damaged, say, they may limit it to 250,000. So it's also important to understand if you're doing um, appraisals and keeping up with what's happening in the marketplace. Because the insurance companies really feel that's imperative. They want to ensure that your artwork, that your collections are insured to value so that you get what it is you expect you get for it. And if it's not insured that way, so on a standard policy, you wouldn't be paid in that way. So does that make sense? I try not to get too deep into it, into the nitty gritties, but just try to give an overview. So kind of the main, main goal is to understand that collections and collectors need different types of policies than what's standardly out there and available. And with that, I'm going to transition on to Aaron to talk a little bit more about the advisor side of things. Well, thank you, thank you. I swear insurance is generally only tolerable when she's talking about it. Um, trust me, I work with, as you saw, 850 other insurance professionals and it becomes intense. Um, but when you do select an insurance professional, here are some things that I guess you haven't quite considered or you may have considered, right? One of the aspects is price. You know, you look at, are they selling you a relationship? Perhaps it's the quality of coverage. Maybe, and if you're like me, they're not selling you at all. We kind of know we need to have insurance. We'll go online, we'll purchase our own policies. Perhaps we'll call in and get some questions answered in that space. If that is you, by the way, please feel free to reach out to me. 
you're going to go to the top of my list. Um, but in addition to that, what if there are some additional buying factors that you guys haven't considered when you're picking an insurance agent? For example, do you want an agent who just gives you a policy premium every year? You pay this, you're done, you know you're protected, and that's you're fine with that, right? You got your life to live. But what if you had an agent who, and let's just say, is trying to turn your protective investment into your home, your art collection, your auto, even your business, and use that as an investment for urban communities, right? So with that being said, it doesn't sound like we're talking about insurance as much anymore. Um, I think for the most part, and I'm sorry to have to get up, but <laughs> um, I do want to still stay on the topic of protection. And part of it is I found protection as a kid in the form of mentorship. Um, there's a man in this room who's been very important to my success, my train of thought. <laughs> sorry, I told you it was coming. But, <laughs> but so from that perspective, from that being said, I just wanted to go ahead and let you know why I became an insurance agent to begin with. Um, I didn't grow up in a community in which, you know, we were taught that, you know, you can achieve your dreams or you can do certain things. I grew up on the east side of Detroit. I'm not sure how many of you guys can relate to that aspect. But from that perspective, it did become a situation to where the way that I talk, the way that I dress, even the, pro the process of solving problems became more along the lines of mentored and developed by this man here. So from that perspective, when I found out that my mentor which we haven't connected in since 2008. It's been a long time. So when I found out, right, like he's still, he's transitioned from antiques into the art world. It did bring out a little passion in me in regards to how many agents are trying to attack this space and understand the value that you guys have at your possessions. Um, so of course, once I asked him about it, he said, oh, well, we don't even know an insurance agent. You guys are, uh, don't have any competition in this space. Made a lot of sense. However, what I wanted to get across to you guys was I know I said we hadn't connected since 2008, and at that time we had a campaign going on that was talking about time for change. And I think um, I didn't understand it at the time, being an 18 year old kid. But he was like, "Well, we have our first black president candidate," and I was just like, "What if I wanted to be?" Or you know, at the same time, I just I guess I didn't under quite understand. Um, that being said, I now understand as a grown adult the pressures that our communities have. Um, so what I wanted to do is essentially take that artwork, those collections, those insurance policies and fuel it, channel it into the urban communities. So with that being said, I started going to my former high school, Southeastern High School. I'm not sure if there's any alumni here. No, <laughs> but, <laughs> but my sixth grade teacher is now the uh, vice principal of that school. So I started working with those kids to help them with their personal professional developments, helping them understand. I got a 15 year old kid who said he wanted to become a mobile mechanic. Right. That was his dream, his pitch, his business pitch. Now I'm trying to figure out why exactly did you want to become a mobile mechanic? And his story was at 12 years old, his mom's car broke down and they live in an area where all too often that's a problem. And they were without it for a week. She lost her job as a result. So there's certain things that just came. So within three years, he learned to fix cars. He can take a car apart. I asked if you could build one from scratch. He said, I'll never afford the parts. But of course, I could build one. So I was like, in three years. You've been able to do all of that. You're not a mechanic, you're an engineer. But because that is not in our areas and in our communities, he does not understand that he can think so much further than where he's going. Um, all the kids that I we did the business pitch competition with all sacrificed a profit. None of them decided to make a profit with their business because they didn't want to price out the communities in which they currently live in. So I get to go and work with these students. I kind of walk through the schools without the red tape because I have the connections in that space. And we grew that competition from one school that has participated this past year to nine schools in the Detroit public schools that will be participating this year. Um, by year three, I do want to take this to a regional slash state model. And from that perspective, I want to get schools involved like Troy. I sit upon the Troy Chamber of Commerce as an ambassador. I'm also an ambassador with the Ann Arbor Ypsilanti Chamber of Commerce. Um, I've talked to people with representation in the Livonia schools. I do want these kids to get the exposure. I want them to understand that there's competition out there. It could be friendly competition. It could be fiery competition. It is what you make it. So with that being said, like I said, it was along the lines of it's been time for change. And I look at the environment out there now. And the issue is I still can't, I haven't quite seen it. So I, in everybody's bag, you do see a little business card from me. And that is my promise, my promise to you guys. That going forward, we will make sure we're ensuring change. So with that being said, 
Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Aaron. Tracy. And it doesn't have you know, you're 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 coming in on the fly, so you don't have to give a long spiel, but you've got a lot to say. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Drake. Um well let me tell you, um it's a quite an interesting story. A few of you have heard this, and you know, a lot of it has to do with Henry Harper. And um probably quite a few of you have had um experiences that are similar. Um, I was working at the Charles H. Wright Museum. And of course, being uh, working in a museum surrounded by arts, culture, you know, history, uh, especially for African American history, um, it was an environment that, um, you know, it, you know, it bred, you know, creativity and arts, and I absolutely loved it. And one of the artists who I was working with at the time, Judy Bowman, you know, I'm sure a few of you have heard of her. Um, she invited me to the Breakfast Club. I had no idea what it was. And I had gone to a few meetings and, you know, I just would sit there and watch. And, you know, I hadn't met Henry. Uh, we had just been briefly introduced. And, you know, Linda Whitaker, another collector, you know, she would see me around. Well, Henry and Linda Whitaker came to the museum one day. And she runs into me and, you know, we're having small talk. And, and she says, Henry is here. Okay, great. That's nice. And she says, you should go talk to him. Okay. So... I go find Henry, and he's sitting in the rotunda, which is the main area uh, at the lobby area of the museum. And, um, you know, I come, I introduce myself, and, and I said, you know, Linda Whitaker, you know, said I should come speak to you. And he says to me in his Henry sort of way, well, what do you want to know? And I was perplexed, like, what is he talking about? And I just stood there for a minute, and I looked at him, and I said, well, I don't know what I don't know. And he says, now we got something to work with. <laughs> and for the next hour, he poured into me about the importance of collecting art, the importance of African Americans being involved in the art of uh, the business of art and how it's such a big industry, a money making industry, tens of billions of dollars each and every year are earned and made in the uh, industry of art. And African Americans really aren't involved in it, not in a scale like we should be. And he explained the importance of generational wealth and how this wealth can be passed on instead of purchasing, you know, cars and clothes and things that, you know, they're nice to have, but they diminish in value and art increases in value. Very rarely do you see anything, any piece of art that decreases in value. And I just sat there listening and my jaw was on the floor because it was something I had never heard. And he, of course, he gives me homework assignments like he often does to start to get me engaged in learning about it. And I've been involved and engaged ever since. What I've gleaned so far from learning um, and collecting and being surrounded is, for one, the beauty of art, how it engages you in your home, how it feeds into your soul, and just having original pieces of artwork, pieces that actually speak to you. That's one. Two, it's nice to know that they gain in value, and even if they don't, it's okay because I have something of beauty in my home that nobody else has. And also, what I'm learning more and more is I've 
visit other collectors' homes and see their collections, which some of them I'm just awe-inspired by, is that these pieces of artwork tell stories. They hold history. Whoever holds that artwork is the one who actually tells the story, who holds the narrative. And I keep that in mind when I see who is purchasing the artwork. And so this is the value that I'm gaining as I'm starting on this journey and I'm enjoying every month. It's an expensive journey, but I'm loving it and it's definitely worthwhile. Yeah. Thank you, Tracy. Good afternoon, everybody. Of course, I could talk about art all day long, but I won't. Um, I'm glad everybody's here. Uh, let me ask, how many people consider themselves collectors with more than three pieces? Raise your hands. Okay, now put those down. How many people are here to learn about collecting? Raise your hands. Oh, we got a, some, oh, it's a student body here. <laughs> well, congratulations. This is an interesting journey. It's something you'll be doing for the rest of your life. It'll be fun. It'll be just absolutely a lot of fun. And if you have kids, they'll be the beneficiary. Now, like she said, all art doesn't go up in value, but I'm gonna tell you what goes up in value. What goes up in value, if you've got your notepads, every piece of art does not increase in value. So don't think that. There's some certain things that are so important that will add to the value of art. But if you're buying art at this level, as it escalates in value, that happens when the artist does their homework that's when the artists get in shows and exhibitions and build up street creds. I use a common term, street cred, but they build up a record. Gilda Snowden, who was a Detroit artist, has a huge exhibition record. And of course, she passed away. And now the art market, the Scarab Club and uh, some other facilities are honoring Gilda Snowden with Gilda Snowden Awards. And those who are fortunate enough to have Gilda Snowden's works, um, you got some money. But I will tell you, there's a primary market is when you buy, when you go to Somerset Mall and buy something new, that's the primary market. The secondary market is the second time it's around if it's secondhand or used. So in the secondary market, um, that has a, an effect on proving the value of art. Artists might take, up, take off like this and go to a level, but when they resell in the secondary market, that makes a difference. Now, as an art advisor, when I work for clients, I try to implement some historic pieces in their collections as foundations in their collections, and then add on current artists uh, in their collections. Generally, nothing, nothing's ever bought because it's pretty. People always say this, and, and a lot of people, I started to name somebody, get myself in trouble, but a very prominent dealer here in Detroit always says, buy what you like. But you know what the problem with that is? When you find out what you should have been buying, the bus is gone and you can't afford it anymore. <laughs> so sometime try to find out as much information as you can. When I interview a client and go to their house, the thing I talk to them about is get out there and look at as much art as you can. Go everywhere to look at it. Go to events and public affairs and all kinds of things to look at art. What was that Trump calling? What was that? <laughs> <laughs> I heard a phone. Uh, I got scared. Uh, <laughs> don't get me started. Uh, so uh, look at as much art as you can, because I tell people all the time, well, they'll say to me, uh, I don't know what I want to buy. Go and look and learn and look and learn. Go to museums, go to shows, exhibitions, come to the breakfast club every Monday at five o'clock at Mary Grove College. And since we moved there, uh, it's doubled. And it's a lot of fun. You get a lot of young artists come in with their work. And I'm telling you, you can buy art from $20 to two, three, four. Well, the highest we've ever sold was $12,000. But the reason I started the Breakfast Club was to enhance artists' careers and teach artists to become entrepreneurs 
because most of the time your kid, you put your kid through college and they told you they want to be an artist, you'd be like, oh my God, really? Because the art business used to be like that, but it's changed because of the internet, because of, uh, and I tell artists all the time, they have vehicles that, I'm not an artist. Well, I start drawing, but I never finished it. I end up doing something else, not cocaine. And so, <laughs> You know, it's really sad when you laugh at your own jokes. <laughs> but uh, I just got into the antique business. I found out there was some little money in them their hills, and that's what happened to me. But Tracy said something earlier, and I'm trying to think. I'm in the senior citizen status now. Um, all art, all, I will say this. All artists is not val valuable. It's just as artists are coming up, I got to say that over and over again. They gain street cred. The street creds are shows and exhibitions. And kids have, oh, that's what it is. Kids, young people have an opportunity to grow their professional, artistic, entrepreneur careers by the use of Instagram, the use of the uh, internet and Facebook and all those kinds of things to show art. And I tell them all the time at Breakfast Club, uh, make sure you put the medium down there when you're showing and get a Facebook page. Put, put what you use to make the work the size of it and put a price out there, a title and whatever it takes before you post things on internet and just get your name out there, work at becoming a artist. And those are the things I want you all to have the opportunity to see and buy. The world has changed. Of course, they keep saying uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, African-American art, Bill Cosby show. Bill Cosby was really the first person to bring art to the forefront because he put it on the back walls of his uh, program. And then they had art auctions, he and Claire, and it was about, about art, JJ, with the, uh, what was the name of the show? Good Times. Good Times. Um, he is a, somebody who bought art to the forefront. And just recently, at the back of that uh, program, Good Times, was that uh, painting. I can't By, Ernie Barnes? Yeah, Ernie Barnes. Yeah. It sold for 15.2 15. Yeah. million. <laughs> Million dollars pre sale estimate 200 to 300,000. And it's whole now. I'll tell you who was interested in it if you want to hear who the underbidders. The young guy who was an investment banker from I think he was from Houston, Texas, of some sort, he's the one who bought it. Mm -hmm. But the underbidder was George Lucas because George Lucas is married to a black woman who's an Marilyn attorney Johnson. and they wanted it for their new museum. And so they had a representative in their auction. It's really interesting to go to those sales because I used to go to a, a ton of them in New York because I would find them the greatest antique treasures in Detroit because of the car business. There was some of the best stuff here. And, and Dumashells has been exporting out of Detroit for 90 years. And so I would find that stuff in Gross Point and take it to New York, to Christie's and Sotheby's and drink Mountain Dew to get there. That's why I wear these big old shoes because of diabetes. <laughs> diabetes, you know, Mountain, Mountain Dew will get you to New York, I'll tell you that. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, I should shut up. <laughs> no, you can, you can, you can, you can keep that. Uh, Henry, you're, you're, you're always, Henry's always fun to listen to. So, you are, you are in your proper line of work. <laughs> you know. So you know what? So, but I, one of the things I want to go, I'm gonna start with you, uh, Catherine and Aaron, really quickly. Uh, we were talking about you talking about ensuring works and uh, you know recognizing the value, and I heard you throw out. 250,000 as a figure, but say somebody wants to have their works appraised. I mean, you know, we, we know what we may have paid for a piece, but then how do you as the appraiser come into the house or to the, to the whatever property that the art is on display and make that assessment the, the, and, and assess a value on the pieces? Well, as, an entrust, as a trusted advisor on this one, I would say you should get a, um, an independent appraiser, all right? Insurance comes in and appraises it. Oh, well, if it's worth $5 million, do we want to pay $5 million for it? So um, I think if you can provide us with proper documentation saying you got this appraised and we can obviously track that appraiser, that's the best way to go about getting your artwork appraised. And I would probably reach out to Henry Harper for that one. Well, I, I only say that because I am a certified appraiser. What? <laughs> But if I sold you something, I can't appraise it because then I can say anything. So just like you said, there, there's guidelines and those kinds of things. But um, things do come into the gallery all the time that just knock my socks off. 
the things that are in Detroit that I didn't even know was here because I'm not from Detroit. I've been here since 91. But things walk in the door and sometimes I can't hold it. I'll just lose it. Not like going to the bathroom, but I'll just lose it because things are just here in Detroit, hidden in houses and in collections. And but, but Henry, though, I mean, the question is, yeah. though, really what, I'm, what I want to know, what, and I think what people want to know is how do you get your artworks appraised? I mean, like, you can come in, like, say, like, right here, we're looking at a Jonathan Harrison. Mm -hmm. And what would you say that's worth right now? Uh, what is John, the value of that? It's a good question. John Harris behind me, he was, uh, and make sure you write that down. I know I'm getting in trouble for this. Jonathan Harris is a Detroit artist, young guy, Breakfast Club member, who started out, I've got some Harris's I bought for $200, $600, that kind of stuff. He did Critical Race Theory, right. which was a painting that was there. sold at a local gallery here in Detroit. Can I say the name of the gallery? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Irwin Gallery, sure. which, is a, <laughs> yeah. which is a wonderful place to go buy art over on uh, the boulevard. And he, Jonathan Harris, Critical, I should have bought it. I should have bought it. I should have bought it. But I can't buy everything. I try to, but I can't. And it was there for $2,500. I just didn't have two to squeeze, you know, but I didn't. Somebody else bought it. And then somebody called P PBS and it went viral. And then John started making uh, prints of it. He made eight of them and he met it and on, on the uh, lockdown for the pandemic. Mm -hmm. He met at Noonie Sherwood Forest Grill, which used to be our home of the Breakfast Club. And he had eight copies of Critical Race Theory. 40 people showed up. He was like, oh, okay. So he renumbered them, reissued a hundred, like 300 people showed up. Oh, so John sold 7,000 copies of Critical Race Theory across the world. I saw, I saw boxes and things, uh, wrappings from going to Vietnam and all over the world. So his statue has rose in the art world. I would not say that probably the first people who got the first 80 of eight or 40 are the ones who got some money. The rest of them are, they're signed by the artist though. Get one. I, only because he gave me one. Oh. Yeah, that's, <laughs> can't buy everything. <laughs> but he did come by and give me one. Well, free is always. Yeah, free is for you. Nothing like, no, nothing, <laughs> nothing like free. I don't, I don't turn down nothing but my collar. Uh, <laughs> so back to this one. Oh yeah, so. <laughs> so John's next series, America was waiting for John's next series. And John's next series was called um, The Pledge of Allegiance. And I told him ahead of time, I said, John, you got to do something to knock the ball out of the park. You got to do something to knock the ball out of the park. And he came up with Pledge of Allegiance. So in this auction will be, I think, two of them from the Pledge of Allegiance series. Now, what are they worth? Replacement value. Pledge of Allegiance have sold for around $4,800. They're going to start in this sale for $850. And these are originals. So I would write up an appraisal which would be from a certified appraiser, for example, to cover for an insurance loss at $4,800 because the market has already proven that people have paid their money uh, for, the, for those uh, Pledge, Pledge Allegiance series. That's where he is now. Another good artist here in Detroit is you know, Chief E. McFly. I don't know if I should mention him. Yeah, yeah, no, trouble. Feel free. Okay. <laughs> Boy, if somebody had a rope, they'd probably put it around my neck right now. I won't look that way. Uh, Chiefy McFly, he started out at Breakfast Club, $150, $150, $200. Those $200 paintings are $8,000 now. Um, $8,000. $8, oh, $8, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so back to you. Um, written appraisals, certified appraisals. There's, uh, uh, there's Kelly Cole, write her name, Kelly Noel. I don't have her number, but write her name down too. She does certified appraisals here in Detroit. She's out in Birmingham. Uh, myself, and then Dumashells does certified appraisals. You don't know that much about African American art, but why is it separated? Well, the Cleveland Museum is trying to get that not separated because African American is part of the American experience. So why does it have to be an African American department? Here it's a little different. Uh, they handle things differently, and it's definitely an African American department. But appraisal numbers are where do you get these numbers? Not off the top of our head. It comes from research. Market, research, art net, those kind of things, the services that we have to join to follow like accomplished. Now, this particular piece, I will say $4,800. However, a piece that size by Jonathan Harris, which may have a totally different subject, it could be fruit and vegetables, that kind of stuff. 
the appraised value for that square inch or the size of the canvas would still be in that, that category. And same thing about Isaiah Ford. He's, he's a young one, start out at Breakfast Club, 50 bucks. He's getting maybe $1,200 for now today. And that's in what, four or five years. This lady, oh my gosh, she got a story to tell. She used to come to Breakfast Club because I, I have four sisters and I'm getting off the thing. I'm not going to look over there. And they're wealthy. Rosemary because, Summers. Yes, they're wealthy because they bought jewelry and clothes and cars and all that kind of stuff. And the kids are not going to get anything. So this lady came to Breakfast Club because she loved jewelry. She would make jewelry. And I hated that because I knew where this was going. So I finally had to had enough. And I asked her if she could paint. And she said, well, I can try. So now that summer's today, maybe around $6,000. And she started out at, I don't even, yes, I do. I just bought one. I bought a small one. But anyway, you just need to add her to your collection, too. Okay, Henry. Okay. And if I can add to that, too, as you mentioned, you would set the appraisal at $4,800 for that item. So it, from a replacement cost perspective. So we look then also at insurance policies. And if you have a policy that's written from a collector's perspective, then there's also additional percentages built into some of those policies. So those are the carriers ask for appraisals generally every three to five years. Right. However, in volatile mm -hmm. situations or if something changes with the artist or something happens quickly, then the insurance companies want them sooner, which again is another reason because say, there's, say the replacement value is 4,800, the insurance company is going to have an option for 150% of that to give some space for continued appraisal until the next appraisal happens in some cases. Yes. 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 Well, not us because we work in the agency side, but the carrier side for sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, for sure. Sure. So what happens essentially, um, if you have a standard policy, what would happen in that case is the depreciated value. Yes. If, yes. So if you add it to your homeowner's policy and that piece of art depreciated at time of loss, how is it depreciated? And, and you know what? I just want to say this. The folks who are out there can't hear your comments. So what I would like to do is get them, if we can get a mic out there, but not just yet. Just if you could rehold some of your comments, because that's a very good question. Okay. And all I'm saying is the people who are listening can't hear you. I can talk loud. You, <laughs> just, <laughs> pardon me. Yes. All right. So stay. Yeah. So. So, so the question the is, question is, are folks are the depreciation when the, when do we get into the depreciating value of art versus the appreciating value? When does that become a uh, a thing? I'm talking about someone who decides to add their policy to their homeowner's policy. Mm -hmm. They say it's worth, let's say, four thousand dollars. Yes. The insurance company comes back and says, well, um, as they do on many things. It's depreciated, you get this percentage of it. That's what, that's yes, yes. So you're correct, sir. On a homeowner's policy, when an item is added for most standard insurance policies, what would happen? Because they're not endorsed from a collector's perspective. It's just a regular homeowner's policy that has basic terms and conditions. The depreciated value would be evaluated at time of loss. So in, the appraisal would be consulted. The current state of the market would be consulted. And that's how the insurance companies do the adjusting to determine whether that value has de decreased or not. If it had decreased, they would pay that lower value on a standard policy. However, on a collector's policy, part of the provisions of those policies is to protect the owner of that artwork from that depreciation. So there are endorsements on the collector's policy to protect you from that so that you do get what you paid for that piece and it doesn't take the depreciation into effect. That's why it's so important to understand the differences and why we work so hard to understand all the carrier forms and what they do. Because if, if, if someone just called, said I need to insure this, I'm gonna add this, I have my five pieces of art, this is what I need to do, this is what they're valued at. Sometimes if someone doesn't know on the other side, they're just gonna say, okay, we'll add those. 
and they don't know to, to speak to that. Ask you, has there been an appraisal? When was the most recent appraisal? Is there anything happening in the, in the art world? You know, the insurance company will generally be able to speak to that, but not if it's a standard policy like that. Definitely look more to the collector side of policies to make up the difference. That is a significant impact to many people who have collections, not even just art, all different types of things that that depreciating value is taken into account. And it's the policies for collectors that do account for that, for sure. Good, that's a great question. Excellent question. I, thank you for illuminating that. And uh, one question that I have about that is like, like for instance, if you have, uh, like Sam Gilliam is an artist uh, who recently passed on to the, mm -hmm to the ancestors and his, uh, his pieces. I mean, I, I could have actually bought a piece of his for $13,000 back in March. And, uh, I didn't, I wish I had, um, and if I had a crystal ball, I would have, but cause I did like the piece, but it was, you know, his, those pieces are going for $70,000. Yes. And I guess my question is versus the depreciation, knowing that that piece has appreciated since his death, I mean, it was maybe it was appraised in March, for instance, and it was it was appraised at thirteen thousand dollars. Yes. But now, since he has passed on, it is now accelerated, and, and now it's worth a much more. How do you treat those kind of situations, and or do you still go based off of the last appraisal? So that is another great question. Generally speaking, the insurance company is going to look at the last appraisal and then the endorsement on the policy if there's that additional percentage. That is why insurance companies in, in unique changing situations or volatile situations look for appraisals to be done much faster than that three to five year period. So once something happens, the recommendation would be sort of immediate appraisal on your work. If you're aware of what's happening in the marketplace, and certainly that would be something that would immediately draw attention. Our carriers have great networks and also will alert their clients of different changes in the marketplace. That's true on the collector side of things, not on the standard insurance side of things in the homeowner side, but on the collector side. Some of the insurance companies actually have additional relationships with galleries and such as well. So they're really on the forefront of, of bringing the information to the surface. And so they're gonna kind of put that alert out. Hey, changing conditions, situation in the marketplace, I would recommend updating your appraisals. Excellent, excellent. And then somebody, and then somebody nationally famous or internationally famous like Sam, oh, you got a question. Yeah. I mean, I know you can ask them, but just come up here if you want. <laughs> okay, all right. So you 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 were going to continue that, Aaron? Oh no, he Miss Harper was saying something before you. Okay, yeah, yeah. Ms. you were you were speaking. <laughs> you said you had a question. You get you was like, go ahead with the question. So I guess you lost train of thought. I guess we just need we just need a Phil Donahue back there to have a mic, you know. But so you know, I guess uh, I I do want to hear your question. But I guess one of the things that I uh, I want to just talk to and uh, just talk about we're, we're talking about our education seminar, and I, I think I opened up with this. One of the things that I I find so fascinating about this particular seminar is that it really shows the sophistication of the uh, Detroit African-American art collection community. I mean, you, I don't think that there is another community, uh, and I, I'm saying this anecdotally, but I don't, think, I don't think that you have this in Philadelphia. I don't think that you have this in Atlanta. I don't think you have this uh, in Chicago, not to this extent, not with people understanding that, I mean, there is, there is an actual ecosystem here of artists and collectors that I, I think is unmatched. That's a beautiful word, ecosystem. It, I mean, it is, and you and you have, I mean, yeah, certainly the Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club is part of it. The uh, National Council of the Arts is part of it. Well, and so, one thing I, I tried to do was it was very important. And, and 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 as well as a number, but I guess my question is, and this is probably more geared towards you. And Tracy, in this market, there is an understanding of not only local and emerging artists in a way that I think 
is probably, uh, like I said, more sophisticated than it is in some other places. But, you know, outside of here, do, uh, do people understand that value? If, you, if, you, if we have an artist outside of a, a blue chip artist, we'll say, who is here locally, are we going to be able to take that? And I, I, are we going to be able to take those artists and get the same type of art? Can, can those artists look to be able to develop a national profile in the same way some of the the earlier artists, the the Ali McGee's and the the problem was with those guys back in those days. It wasn't the internet, internet and the um, Instagram. It wasn't available to them. And because they were African-American artists, they were not welcomed into many galleries because the galleries felt that there was no market for their work. And even today, I try to convince Dumont Shelves, uh, one of the old owners is still there. So after, whenever she decides to go wherever she's going, uh, <laughs> the younger ones will understand the diversity and the possibilities yeah. of the market. But right now, she's holding the, the grip. Yeah. And as a result of that, um, I haven't seen you in a long time. Nice to see you. The mayor of Southfield, a member of the Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club. Yeah. Ken Severs. There he is. And he loves art. Hello, Mr. Mayor. And he's well, also pulling pulling a lot of art in to the uh to the community here in Southfield and the library. And uh you still want to do something with the pavilion? All right. Um, <laughs> what? Okay. Yeah, Priscilla Pfeiffer is in the library right now. Priscilla Pfeiffer and somebody else. Who is it? Who's isn't somebody else in the joint show? Yeah. His mommy is at the. Her work oh, is at the. <laughs> <laughs> at, at the Phil, at the uh, okay. Southfield Library. So All get right. an opportunity. Remember, I told you we got to look at art and look at art and look at art and make ourselves more familiar with it. So go over to the library and see her exhibition. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Oh no, you're great. Oh, no, I was thank you. Plug in for your no, mom. Thank you. because, no, no, yeah. definitely. Yeah. I don't she, know. But she's serious is, but... about her art. She's not a Sunday morning morning painter. She's very serious, and we have some in, we have accomplished artists here yeah. <laughs> and accomplished. <laughs> I want to add that you know, I mean, in the, in the seven years that she's been associated with. The Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club, uh, her career has ballooned. And, and I, I look at the, the Fine Arts Breakfast Club like a church, and she's one of the deacons. Yes, she so is. is Tracy. She is. So, she is. you know, so is Joan. She got us involved. So is with, Sharon. Yeah, Sharon. A uh, whole bunch of collectors out there. And, deacons. And um, <laughs> Dexter. Deacon and, committee. But I would like to add um, when it comes to. Uh, building um, a community of collectors outside of this group. I would say education is, is imperative, and I'll tell you why. I would not have thought myself to be an art collector in, mm -hmm. until I had been educated on the importance of it and, and why it matters. So when I'm speaking to, you know, cohorts of my friends, uh, girlfriends of mine, and I talk to them about collecting art, and let's say, for example, I just mentioned, you know, a, a, a random piece of artwork, and I'm not talking about anything expensive. I, you know, I'll say something maybe a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, and that, you know, and that's, you know, an emerging artist. For someone who is not familiar with that, they're going to think, oh my gosh, that's ridiculous. I would never spend that amount of money because they're thinking they're used to purchasing something. Um, you know, maybe at Art Fan or, or the mall or, you know, for something that maybe costs a, hundred, a couple hundred dollars. They don't know the investment value. They don't know uh, or they, the, the value of what it can bring to their household and how it can appreciate. And so with the Internet, with social media, there is a huge opportunity uh, for education through whether it's through snippets, whether it's artists telling their stories, whether it is providing the um, financial value of it, the insurance value, the market value of, of something. Because, you know, through, uh, let's say through media, let's say through HGTV, you know, people understand what it is to purchase a home 
for cheap for a thousand dollars and then they you know build it up and they flip it they understand that now because of hgtv the same thing can be done in art through social media and you know various uh, forms of education thank you tracy that's actually a question that you kind of spoke to it a question that somebody just emailed in and asked uh, a moment ago and uh the question is what are some reliable websites used for selling works of my art? Do you know any? Well, Outside of Instagram, is I know there's Saatchi. Um, can get into Saatchi. There is um, Artnet. There is also um, Black Art in America. Um, that was originally started as a nonprofit organization. Now they do have their own platform in which to sell their own art as well. So, um, and there are more and more uh, platforms that are going to be emerging, you know, as time goes on. You know, people in this room will be having their own, you know, plat uh, platforms to purchase art. So that's just the beginning. And the art market, uh, especially for African American art, is really, really growing because, you know, when I'm reading um, periodicals like um, oh, what uh, business periodicals, and they're talking about the art market, you know, the art world, you know, prices have gone bananas. So they're always going to seek out the next best thing where it is lower in cost. The African American art is that next thing. And it's been going like that for the past few years, maybe the past, what, eight to 10 years? And that's why the popularity of, of it is merging so much. Because one of the reasons. Prior to that, um, you had to really go out and find. The, the, uh, teachers organizations and fraternity or mostly sororities they sold art back in the day like Tupperware they had parties in the houses and those kinds of things uh, the guy who just died uh, uh, Ron Scarborough Ron Scarborough and Benny White old older Detroit artists they said oh my god we never had this network back in the day right and it's a new network it's a growing network but I'll say this and I hope I don't get in trouble for this but um, football 15 18 billion dollars a year business. I used to work for Ralph Wilson who owned the Buffalo Bill. And I remember I walked in his house and I looked at the art. I didn't know where he was. I just met him in Gross Point on or his wife on a hill. And um, I saw who's got Claude Monet in their house. I mean, who's got Renoir? I mean, these incredible paintings. Amazing. And there were no, fur no furniture there because he just got a divorce and the fur wife took the furniture to France. And so I saw these incredible paintings and I just couldn't get over it. And so I asked the wife, you know, she was girlfriend there. I said, Mary, are these things real? And she says, yes. And I'm thinking, Hi, why do you, what, are you serious? She said, my husband plays with them. I said, what does that mean? She said, he'll buy them and hold on to them for a minute and make a couple million, a few million off of them and then he'll flip them and turn them over to us. The guy died with $13 billion. But um, football, 15 million, 18 million, golf, 20 to 30 billion. I should have said billion with football. Art is a hundred billion dollars and we don't know nothing about it. And so I want all of us to do one thing is leave the kids, the nieces, the nephews, something, but also bring them along with you and teach them about art. Now, when you say teach them about art, things to buy, there's nothing as good as buying an original because you got the only one. If you're going to buy print, P-R-I-N-T, Make sure they're low numbers. Picasso established during his practice that anything above 375 print numbers is just toilet paper. Consider Charmin instead. <laughs> so, so keep it under 350 if you can. The next thing, nothing like an oil painting or those always, of course, different artists do different things. Sam Gilliam made his own paper. Uh, there's an artist here in Detroit whose name is Mandisa, who makes her own mm -hmm. uh, fab mm -hmm. fiber. Mm -hmm. And she's unbelievable. I, she's Mandisa Smith. Who? Mandisa Smith. Yeah, Mandisa Smith. Phenomenal, phenomenal. She used to own a place over on Living awesome. on Lake. Yes. And she, so that's somebody to write down in your, I'm giving you stock tips. Uh, 
uh, Mandisa Smith. Uh, oh, another stock tip, Joshua Rayner. OMG. Uh, Jay Graham. OMG. You can buy his stuff for $150. So, I'm sorry. No, that's no, this is great because I mean, you know, these are some folks that I'm, I feel like I'm on the right track because I have some of these pieces in my collection. Oh, do you? Jay Graham? I got a Jay Graham. I got a Jay Graham doing at the height of the Jay Graham. You remember Sheefy came to Breakfast Club and he was fifty dollars, forty dollars, sixty. Now he's in the yeah. multi thousand. Jay Graham is is. I'm telling you, look, when artists are dedicated to what they do, love their their practice, and really put forth and put effort and get in shows. Loretta Brown, she's another uh, Detroit artist, absolutely, who does incredible, amazing work. I own a piece that was gifted to me from Harold Braggs, and I can't stop looking at it. I can't stand her as a person, but I love her work. <laughs> All right. Okay, Thank I'm you. sorry. I'm sorry. I got All off right. track. You know I'm what? sorry. So, <laughs> and she's sitting gonna... in the audience with a gun. <laughs> she's a wonderful artist. She's an absolute wonderful artist. That's somebody you need at the right. Southfield Center. Loretta, okay. Loretta N. Brown. All right. I know there are a lot of folks that got a lot of questions brewing in their heads out there. So I was just going to ask that you could make your way up here to the podium and ask them. You want Sharon? You gonna come up? Thanks. Stay away from G Clay's. That's nothing. More so than a question, certainly a statement. A lot of you are asking, where can I buy art? Coming up is the Torch of Western Foundation, Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club auction. It is online September 18th through the 25th. All of the pieces will not be online. We are holding 15 for a live auction. The live auction will begin at 4 p.m. on September 25th. Please make sure you come out. As Henry said, if you're not buying, take a look at it. Only thing I ever ask my children today, two questions. Did you like the piece? If you didn't like the piece, Tell me why you didn't like it. I'm okay that you didn't like it. I just want you to have a point of reference of maybe what you're looking for. But at least you have an opinion. Keep looking at art. But most of all, keep in mind September 18th through the 25th for the Torch of Wisdom Foundation and the Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Hannah Center, that's another place to buy art. It's uh, downtown in uh, Detroit. I got the mic now. You got uh -oh. the mic. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. I'm scared now. We scared. <laughs> I, I, want, uh, I wonder if you could speak to the importance of documenting uh, the artist. In other words, what galleries they're in, whether they've been on television, whether they've been uh, copied. Uh, I, I think you call it Providence, but yeah, the importance of you documenting your art. Okay, so, and, and keep this in mind, it's really important because people always build a file and we put them away down the, so when the kids come in after we're gone to heaven, the kids, <laughs> the kids come in and they see the art on the wall and they don't like the color of it and they don't like the frame and people like me come in and get it for $50. And I don't mean to say that like that, but if, it's, if you want 50, I'm going to give you 50, you know. So put things in there. Put, put behind each piece, put records or provenance. Like he said, if you had a piece that's borrowed that's in a museum show, ask the museum, because they always throw those things away. Ask them for the tags that go along with the art. Right now, Detroit Fine Arts Professional Club has a huge exhibition at the Detroit Historical Museum. And that's never been done before. They saw the show at the Plowshare and then, the, and the show is beautiful. That's your homework assignment. Go to the Detroit Historical Museum and see that show. It's a beautiful, beautiful, show. well done, unbelievable. And, and Henry, yeah. uh, what kind of things would be considered provenance? I mean, obviously- ex Sales receipts, what you paid for them, the receipts. Um, articles. Exhibition, articles that relate to the artist. 
piece. It doesn't have to be your piece, but the fact that, and glue, when I was at the uh, conservation lab at the Detroit Institute of Art, which is somewhere to go, I tell you, I want to put on gargles. And um, behind uh, that painting, they got worth a billion dollars. I can't think of the name of it, the wedding dance by uh, Burglar, Burglar or somebody. But anyway, on the back of it, those Picassos are just the most incredible business cards from the period and different things. And the reason you put it with the piece, because it stays with the piece. Keep your files over here if you have to, but put it behind the piece, because when the kids take it off the wall, and I'm talking about estate planning, because that's what, I, that's what I do. And so when they take it off the wall, the history is behind the piece. So put, put an envelope back there and put things in an envelope. Tape it with, and the tape, if you're going to tape it, do not use scotch tape. Do not use, well, tacks are all right, but I would say use blue painter's tape to attach everything on the back of your because that's reversible, it'll come off. It's uh, kind of archival and it lasts for a long time. So put those things behind. And this is the things for you owners to put behind your work. Make the kids aware of it. I have clients I've worked with for years. I would, I would take the kids at dinner time and make them sit around the table and for example, put a Chippendale chair on the table because they gonna keep asking me, instead of reaching for the corn, they keep looking at that Chippendale chair. And so you keep asking them and I have some clients that we build collections for them. Don't make it a, uh, and, yeah. And I just got a, a, another uh, email that says, is it good to change prices on a painting depending on where it is being sold or should a work of the same price always, should the same price be used once it is placed for selling? I don't know. Okay, I think what they're trying to say is, do you go up in the market? Well, that's if you got the capability of doing, using ArtNet and some of those other research sources, because if I do appraisal, I got to go through ArtNet and I got to go through all those things that we belong to or have memberships to to do to make it market adjusted, adjusted appraisals. But to do it yourself, that's mm, no. I don't know. How and you and do, do you recommend nowadays with with uh, and, and I guess this is for you and Tracy as well, uh, with there being such easy access directly to your market with your market, is it necessary to go through a gallery nowadays? I mean, do you feel like do you feel like a gallery adds a as a certain value that doing it on your own does not? It's uh, been my experience. Of course, um, you can go directly to the artists, and that's one of the benefits of working through the internet. You know, artists are more than happy to sell their work directly to you. However, when you are working with a gallerist there is an opportunity for education, um, not only for that particular artist, but for that genre of work, or uh, for an entire perspective on what's going on in the market. Um, the artist is going to tell you specifically what is going on with him and his work. So that is the difference between him working with an individual artist versus working with a gallerist. The only advantage of going to a gallery, and I'm not going to say that just because I want y'all all to come to my gallery. The, <laughs> advantage, the advantage of going to a gallery is that you're working with, if you make a mistake and kill your next door neighbor, you're going to go get a good lawyer. You're not going to go get a half shot lawyer. You're going to go get a good lawyer. So if you're thinking about building a collection on a certain level, then you go to get some really good advice with it. You can go to the gallery, or, or I'm sorry, to the artist studio. That's a wonderful place. Then you get to see all kinds of work that they do, watercolors, um, uh, print, well, prints and all those kind of things and, and uh, um, experimental pieces. I would, I'm, okay, your turn. Hi, I am an artist uh, since a long time and I have a question and I think it's a very interesting question regarding the prices, changing the prices to one venue to another. So I usually work series like the last series was called Positive Flesh and they are like naked bodies and uh, another series, Tribe series. So I like to work series. When I finished one of my exhibitions, I think that once the, the series are, I start a new series, I, I don't value the, the last series. I start working the new one and those remain pieces, when I go to an art fair, I sell for a lower price. So that is the thing, that I am so condemning you, so you, my 
you want the next person to have the newest piece. Yes. At another price. I I love the price because I want to get rid of that pieces. I need to create Ooh. and create and create. Ooh, here's the Kmart lady. Yeah? Clear itself. Yes. So I I am talking. I came here to learn. So this was a very nice question. So theoretically, you want, you want to ask. move your merchandise. That's what you want to do. Right. Once the pieces uh, doesn't belong anymore to that um, important moment that I am selling a story, and the story has different independent pieces that tell so the whole know, story. Just, just to wait what? till the end of your series, and then we can get it cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you can go to my booth in the next hour. Fair. It's in Ferndale. <laughs> and uh, yes, all those pieces, I said, when they are not together, doesn't have the same meaning. Same story to you, right? What? When they're not together, they don't have the same story to you. Exactly. They lose value for me. Blue light special. So what happened with those pieces that remain loose? I want to ask to the experts what happened. Should I treat them like unique pieces? One different pieces? Or... Uh, the, the value, they, they, they keep the same value. The only thing, Marta, the only uh, thing is that art is not, and, and you do original art, it's not like a retail market. Um, you produce the works, they're handmade, hand produced, I assume come out of your brain. So that whole discounting thing, that's interesting. Maybe that's why you sell so much stuff. Oh. <laughs> I am productive, and I just want to be able. But to, I'd be scared to buy um, something from you, then it'll go down in value. You know. <laughs> thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Okay. Aside from collecting, or these, uh, aside from collecting, these are, aside from collecting, are these current artists? Who are offering in the stock market? I don't know who who made this question here. I can't read it. Aside from collecting. Aside from collecting. Oh, okay. Are there current artists that are offering shares, or who are being traded on the market that we can invest in? Are you are you referring to like an NFT? You you saying take the, buy a part of a painting? No, no, no. Okay, because people are touring, tor they're touring with that idea to sell shares in a painting. But then, unfortunately, that's, like that's, NFTs, that's that's, that's an NFT. Yeah, yeah. and they've they've kind of dropped. I, I don't know. Yeah, they they the conversation about them is kind of fizzled, and I don't know if we have any experts up here to to talk about it to defend Mark uh, about it in any kind of detail. Mark, but, you want to talk but, about NFTs? <laughs> but unfortunately, I, I don't. You know, people my my talk. personal my my personal opinion. I'm I'm real tactile. I want to touch my art, and I think most of us in here want to touch it too. I don't want to look at it on a screen and have a on a pixel. Okay, well, Mark, since you're not going to answer it, you're not going to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and so. You know, and I, I guess the question I was trying to ask earlier, and I didn't do a good job of asking it, is uh, I was saying we had this wonderful community of art collectors and artists in Detroit. I, I would, what would be wonderful is if we could infect other places with this same type of energy so that the rising tide here would lift the boats of other arts Ooh, communities. Wow. Uh, in other depth. places, and so I'm, I'm glad we're doing this digitally. But I know that you've had some done some outreach. No, well, so Bedford, Massachusetts, yes. has started a breakfast club in the outside of Boston mm -hmm. uh, area by a guy named Ron Forte, who's married to a Detroit doctor. Who was his name? Doctor. He lost his leg on the Battle of the Belle Isle Bridge. Doctor William Bachelor. His daughter lives in Belt, and he's married to her. And they started a breakfast club over there, and it's doing very, very well. They're a little more straight laced than we are because the Robert Rules of Order and that kind of stuff. You know, we were like wild and crazy at Breakfast Club, and it has nothing to do with me. And uh, so, then, then 
<laughs> well, I don't want to do boring. People always do right. boring. Right. Let's put some excitement in life. It's so short. I'm almost at the end. 71. <laughs> I don't, and it happens so quick. Also, somebody called me the other day uh, about starting one in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And guess what I told them? What's that? I said, great idea. Just come and have a talk and we'll, we'll, we'll see about it. And I said, why don't you talk to your buddy and see about having it at her place? And she says, where? I said, they're building a new museum. She lost her mind when I said that. The Obamas. Oh, right. Yeah. Sweet. To you, bring the art community together. So I said, yeah. if you pay for a couple of dollars in gas, I'll drive there and talk all day long with a mic and uh, give and that, you some. That's their, this was this person's buddy. Yep. The Obamas. Uh, Michelle is. Okay. And that's she a, says she's just going to fly with that idea because it'll bring unity in the community and art, 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 art. Yes. Yes. I, I can repeat it. Backing on Marta, um, how do you, I don't want it to screech, how would you, so we have art that has not sold. So I have art like in my house that I, hasn't sold. Can I insure that under the collectors? So that's a great question. It's a hard question, yes, but it's a good question. So it's a little bit different when you are an artist and you're selling your work. That is more uh, along the lines of a commercial insurance policy. So you're an individual um, artist selling work, kind of your own gallery, essentially, is what's happening. And so the, your artwork, yes, can be insured. Um, as you start selling art and as you start generating um, uh, kind of a recap of what you have sold and what's coming up, the insurance companies will look at that from a valuation perspective. So it's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the artist, what type of art's being created, how frequently it's being sold, all of those different types of things. But you can purchase insurance as an artist. You can insure your work. And um, essentially, like if something were to happen, let's say there was a fire, you would have to be able to demonstrate as an artist what you anticipated your loss of income to be based on market value, yes, correct. So there are ways of doing it to, to ensure um, individual artists' artwork in galleries, for sure. And I we want can you to do work it. hard to get it, your art out there. It ain't doing no good in your house. Get it out there. Internet, internet, John Beeline is sitting behind you. He's got a gallery. Reach these people and get out there and get get it out there. You got, and, and another thing, kids, people come to Breakfast Club all the time for the first time. It happened last week. A uh, lady said um, $750. She, she yelled. And I knew damn well she wasn't worth $750. <laughs> now, she might have been worth $750, but her work. <laughs> and so everybody knows what I do up front. Huh? Henry, she's here. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I see. <laughs> so what I, the first thing I do, and everybody who at breakfast club, when I'm sitting up here at the counter, they know what I'm doing. I said, oh, so now tell me, where did you sell your work before? I always hear this from young people. My mother, my sister, my cousin, my uncle, and a fat lady down the street. <laughs> so why do you think your work is $750? Then they'll say to me, well, I put a lot of time in that. Yeah, you did, but this ain't the factory floor. So what you have to do is get your work in people's collection. You might have to start at 80 or $100. The famous ones did. Judy Bowman, all of them started there. And they got their work out there and got it in collections. Another thing, keep up with everybody you sell your babies to. You made them babies. Keep up with who you sell them to. Make a record of it. And don't just put is the it name. It's important to have a certificate of authenticity. Everybody's going crazy with that. Um, you can, I mean, you can do it. Everybody's doing I like it to now. Request one from yeah, the artist that you can. I buy. That started with Breakfast Club. They, they took yeah. them to the patent office. Yeah. Um, Carol, what was her name? Yeah. To, yeah, and they just went crazy with that. Uh, the man with the questions. <laughs> dun 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 dun. How about the importance of getting a picture 
of you with the artist and your art. Yeah, Cornell, that's great. If you, yeah, somebody has the question. They said, what if you're selling it online? I don't know how you're going to do that one. But yeah, documentation, that adds, Cornell, that adds to documentation. That adds to you knowing where your baby is. And then collectors need to get that picture too, that you bought it from the artist at the particular location. But you may not necessarily get a picture with the artist with the piece of artwork, but what you can do is hang it up in your home and take a picture with the piece of artwork and post it. And that's good for the insurance company too. Here comes, yeah, I knew, I knew here comes Joan. As much as y'all talk, right? Hi, I'm Joan Britton. I'm a local artist and I am a collector. Now to the insurance people, when I started collecting and I checked with the insurance company and they suggested an additional rider on my homeowners, but I also took pictures. I had the certificate of authenticity for each piece of my artwork. And I also videoed my condo with all the pictures on it, on the wall, wherever. So with that said, is this something that your insurance company is doing or do you have suggestions? Because I haven't heard you say, this is what we do in order to evaluate how much your artwork is worth. And if you don't know, who do you send to the home to look at it? That's a great question. And it really depends on the insurance company that's selected because every carrier has a little bit of a different uh, array of services available. So sometimes, yes, what you did is essentially you documented and did the, did sort of some of the pre-appraisal work for what you had for your from a collection perspective. So insurance companies love that. But in addition to that, the collections, the carriers that write collections do have additional services. Well, they'll make suggestions. They'll provide some resources. Um, they'll take that information and add it to their file and then enhance it along with appraisals and other pieces of information. There are some companies that will do that. So, so like third party vendors, and we can get a vendors list out to the group too, if that would be helpful. So that do help um, kind of gather and document what collection, what's in a collection, but it's not, across, it's not all insurance companies. It's definitely not across the board. We're lo definitely looking into the collection side of things. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Catherine. Catherine, I have one other question about that. So could you provide a little bit more clarity about when it's appropriate, more appropriate to do, to just have a rider on your home owner's insurance versus the collector's policy? I know you touched on that, but I'm not sure I quite got sure. it. And then on the collector's policy, if you could speak a little bit about what companies write those policies, if you have some knowledge on that. Sure, absolutely. So when it comes to riders on the homeowner's policies, it really depends on what you're collecting and what the values of those things are. So most homeowner's policies have some level of endorsement, but they'll limit things like um, jewelry or art or furs or firearms. They'll have a specific bucket, so you can't buy a limit higher than that. Then there's other policies where if things are very documented, they will allow a specific, <coughs> what they call a collections rider to be added to the policy, but that is generally done on a manuscript basis, which means they take specifically your work and they reference that in endorsement. Because the homeowner's insurance companies aren't really set up to cover large collections and a lot of variety, it's more of a, I'm gonna say a vanilla policy. Okay, it's just very basic. Then when we look at the collector side of things, they are truly designed for the exposures that are unique to art and collections. So the things like decreasing and changing in value, if you lose one of your pair or set, what do you do? What happens to the value of it? Well, the insurance company is gonna make you whole on a collector's policy versus not on the others. So 
we work in all 50 states. There are state-specific insurance companies, depending on what state everybody lives in, that offer homeowners policies with endorsements. Some of the big names on the collector side of things that you'll hear are Chubb and Pure, AIG, sometimes you'll hear Cincinnati, Hanover. Those are some of the other carriers that handle some of the larger schedules and that we see most commonly. They have the, I would say, the broadest coverage in the market, unless you need something special, in which case there's always the alternative market where you can get something really manuscript specific to your collection. Thank you, Catherine. Watercolors, keep hey. watercolors <clears throat> away from outside walls. When you have watercolors, keep them away from outside walls. Outside walls do what I do when I go jogging, sweat. And the sweat bleeds through to the, I'm sorry, Joel, I can't help myself. Just pray for me. Uh, <laughs> your, your mama. Uh, and so, <laughs> but sweat bleeds through to your painting. So that's why you see sweat marks on things. So anything made out of paper, the drawings and watercolors, keep them away from the outside walls unless there is a, a archival, um, it's a white board, I can't think of it right now because of uh, the, it's in between it in your framing. Also, I'm gonna tell you this and folks gonna get mad at me, but I say it every week and I haven't been assassinated yet. And I write in open convertibles, don't buy anything that's not signed. If it ain't signed- and where should it be signed? Where should the piece be signed? I mean, if that's it's another a, thing. If it's a, I prefer, I tell people this all the time, picture. particularly at Breakfast Club, because I'm talking to artists, it should be signed on the front. You can't go in an art gallery or a museum and flip a painting on the back to see who painted it, or you're going away for three to five years. <laughs> so, so, so it should be signed on the front, because when you walk up to a painting, you look at the image and take it all in and take it on, then you go right down to where the signature. You can put the signature wherever you want to. Picasso had fun. He had it all around the frames and everything else, but they were all signed on the front. Now, back before high school, a lot of people didn't sign their work, and we have to be sleuths in the art market to try to find works that are not signed and attributed. I got Charles McGee's, I found at flea market, so it's a garage, $100, $50, they were $18,000, but he didn't sign them. So it's gonna cost me $2,000 to have them authenticated. Now, why you go, Mr. Henderson, why would you put somebody through that? <laughs> He's a great photographer. So sign your work all the time. Don't buy any, if it ain't signed, I'm sorry, don't buy it. Another little secret to do is if you have this wonderful painting, you can ask, ask the artist for the drawing that went with the painting. The DIA is known as an encyclopedic museum because they have a great collection of sub drawings it goes with the major paintings in that museum. So it's rated fourth, fifth in the world in terms of uh, how deep it is because they have, so ask the art, just ask them. Make it a little bargaining tool or, you know, if you can find that study drawings or study pieces to get to the end of the work, that, those are the things you want to add to your collection. So if it's not signed, I want to say that again. Now, they, many people say I signed on the back and I had to argue with these people like crazy. And then sometimes I just unplug and let them do what they got to do and, you know, what can I do? I'm old. But sign it on the front. So don't put your money in work that's not signed. The front is preferable. Your turn. <laughs> can I just yes. add to that? Please. So Mr. Harper made a great point where art is placed on the wall is important. So in, there, in your bags, there are some applications. Let's pretend you took your um, current policy. You wanted to look at a different insurance company. Let's say you have a homeowner's policy and you want to look at a collector's policy. When the insurance company receives your application and your information, they're going to take the basics that you send about your uh, collection. So whether it's the videos and the pictures that you have, they're going to look at um, any appraisals. In some cases, the insurance company will ask to do a risk review, in which case they would walk through your home and they would take a look at everything, where it's placed, if there's heavy objects, are the walls reinforced? Things like that before they'll actually offer a quote. So it really depends again on the collection, the size of the collection, the pieces that are in the collection, the insurance companies will do that. But that is one of the other things that some of the other insurance companies offer. That's definitely on the collector's side of things, not so much on the homeowner's side of things. 
but it's a benefit. Sometimes, if sometimes um, collectors may not know everything about where it should be placed or such, or they could have a vendor come in and hang something for them, and that vendor doesn't do a good job at doing that. These collection policies are also set up where if you have a situation like that, your policy would respond to that if someone installed it improperly and then it was damaged. Thank you. Are there any special considerations for insurance if an artist has asked to um, have you lend your artwork to have it shown in a gallery? Yes, that's another great question. For an event. Yes. So if you are a collector and you are going to loan your work to someone else on a standard homeowner's policy or a basic policy, that is not covered. So if, if you are just insuring it there, once it leaves your location, in most cases, it's not covered on a standard insurance policy for a homeowner's policy. If on the commercial or on the collector side of things, though, there's specific coverage for that. Worldwide coverage while in transit, so not even just when it gets there, when it's in transit to that location, no matter what the situation is. Now, they are going to ask questions. Who's going to collect it? Who's going to transport it? How is it going to be packaged? Who's going to unpackage it? Who's going to rehang? They're going to ask a bunch of questions, but those policies are designed for that specific situation, whereas homeowners kind of, I don't want to say put a Band-Aid, but kind of do. They, they give you a little bit of extra, but not enough in some cases. And it's my understanding that you could also ask the institution in which you're loaning it to, to see if they will insure it and ask about what kind of coverage they will provide. Absolutely. They will 90% well. of the, in fact, I've never even heard of, all of them generally have, like what's going on at the Hannon Center is um, Leroy Foster, who was a famous Detroit mm -hmm. artist, and there's a wonderful show there. And they insure those, you know, from the minute they pick it up from your house, that's generally what the it what museums, the registrar's office do that. They send out shippers and handlers, and it's insured the minute it leaves your house in there, because it could be a car accident and those kind of things. When you have pieces in your collection, if somebody asks a reputable uh, uh, institutions, if not a strip club, but if they ask to borrow your work, <laughs> Sharon, wake up. If they, ask, <laughs> if they ask to borrow your work, you should loan it. You should loan it to them because it just adds provenance. It adds value. More eyes who see your work. And another thing, sometimes share your collection with your friends. Educate them. How can they learn if you don't? People, I know people got collections. They don't want nobody to see it. It's all down to here. But share it because that's, it circulates. You educate your friends, your associates, and even the people you hate. Educate them. <laughs> educate them because you have a collection. I haven't seen it, but I heard about it. <laughs> what do I mean? I'll just add one you more. Know, oh. I was just going to jump onto that. As as you mentioned, when you, as uh, an artist if you do, or a collector, if you do give your work to someone else and it is a commercial entity that says they're going to insure your work, ask them to give you a certificate of insurance documenting. They do have your work. Make sure it outlines everything about your work, the value, all of that, so that you have that in hand. So if something does happen and it's not insured on your policy, you have that. To, that's kind of like your ticket to file a claim. So, so should we put together some type of appraisal insurance special where we can get Henry to do their appraisals and we come to you guys and you all do our art and give a, everybody here a discount? <laughs> sure. <laughs> We, we love will, a group discount. We would be we're, happy we're, to we're help. We're recording this right now. <laughs> we would be happy to help with that. You know, I know we have a lot of collectors here, and, and uh, they're, I know they're being coy, and there's some of them I know because I've seen their collections, and I'm looking at two of them right now. <laughs> and I just see they have a wealth of knowledge, uh, and I, I want to call out the courtesies because... <laughs> because they've been collecting for quite some time. And I want to know if, if you all have ever had any issues in, in appraising your works and getting uh, the value for them after they've been appraised. And uh, if, you all, if you all have had, I know you all have been collecting for a long time, so I'd imagine that you all have had that experience. 
and considering your legal background, I, I figured this wrangling that you've had to do to get the value out of the pieces that you've collected. Hello, I'm Daphne Curtis. Okay, my name. <laughs> I'm Paul Curtis. How are you? Good. Uh, good afternoon. We've been collecting for well over 40, 40, 45 years. Don't think you're that old. <laughs> I didn't meet you, but last week. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> I'll, <take you> home. <laughs> I'll drive you home. <laughs> I have the keys. Anyhow, um, no, and, and getting in a, 40 years ago, there was an issue of trying to get appraisal. OK, however, well, it's because one, it's not having information Two, uh, not knowing who was capable of doing the appraisals. So it was reached around. I mean, we we did crazy stuff like reaching out to uh, Shirley Woodson Reed and she then in turn introduced us to uh, Camille Brewer. Uh, so there was a that lot was of crazy. That was smart. Well, yes, it was because we're talking about incredible people and this incredible story. And Camille Brewer, we didn't know she was a heavyweight artist as well, but she also well-trained in terms of, she, she did cataloging of, at one point in time, Charles McGee's work. And I found that out from her. Uh, anyhow, um, no, we haven't had a problem in terms of value, uh, getting the appraisal of it. The, the thing is, of course, is doing a continuing upgrade. The market has changed. I mean, we, we have a foundational uh, collection as well as contemporary and in between. And in some of the artists, we have an encyclopedic collection. Uh, didn't know it at the time, but then we Henry came along and told us, you know, you knuckleheads, you have a museum style collection. And he did talk like that. Um, no, however, the bottom line on all of it is you get the collection, you get the collection appraised, you do the work in terms of educating yourself as to how you maintain your collection, both in terms of learning how to, how it's hung or how it should be hung if you're not doing it yourself, uh, where it should be hung, rotating your work in your house. If you don't have enough space, and I hope you have this problem where you have more work than you can hang, rotate that work in and out and thereby the elements uh, ultraviolet rays etc cetera, etc cetera, can, can have a an impact on your work so you want Joan. your work you want to be able to have a a uh, uh, atmospheric control storage area where you can maintain your work you want to be smart enough to be able to we we've gone from detroit to philadelphia i Put, what, what would you say the, uh, the, the your, what was your experience in Philadelphia like as it related to that art collecting community? Um, I was surprised. Philadelphia, I thought, was a more cosmopolitan, sophisticated art community. Not so. Uh, Paul and I went to more than one uh, art artsy event while we were there. We were there for a couple of years helping our daughter and son-in-law with our grandchildren. And although they do have a, an established art community and they do have a number of prominent collectors of African-American art and artists, it's nothing compared to Detroit. Um, there are many more artists of note in Detroit uh, who have uh, their art in a number of collections and museums. Uh, there are more meetings of artists and collectors on a regular basis here in Detroit than in Philadelphia. And of course, we couldn't get up at any one of the meetings and say, uh, we are so not impressed. Um, and, that, and that's not to say 
that they don't have a substantial art community. It's just that we should recognize that the Detroit art community, the artists and the collectors, both the established and the emerging um, has not gotten the note that it should, uh, but it's getting to that point. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Well, you should applaud yourselves. In, in our community of the nature in terms of not just Detroit, the Detroit metropolitan area, which also reaches over to Kalamazoo, which reaches up to uh, Flint, uh, is sophisticated, much more sophisticated than people. They think we're a bunch of rubes, you know, and all we got going on is house fires and I guess in, in uh, alligator shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. We have art, there's art and the artists. I learned this, my starter kit was with George and Anandi. My starter kit was a uh, L loving kind of situation. L loving, um, Ed Clark, Ramir Bearden. Uh, oh yeah, Artist Lane. How I forget. And I mean, I chased uh, Howard Dina Pendale. She's out of Philadelphia. Her work. The artists. They loved to come here because their work was getting out. And they would come. I, I mean, I met Overstreet. I went to dinner with Overstreet. I went to, you know, hung out with uh, Ed Clark. He started pointing out local artists. Get this, get this, get this. You know, uh, some people's art, such as. Uh, and now uh, Ed Clark is selling for a million dollars plus, half a million for the watercolors. And yeah. back in those days, they were two, three thousand dollars. Yes. You could get. It. You could get. It. Or you can buy some stocks. Well, I think one of the things that we have emphasized to our children, as well as to our contemporaries, is somebody, that somebody's at your door. Yes, is that <laughs> furs, suits, dresses, cars are nice, but it's conspicuous consumption. If you invest in art, it out it outstrips any other business out there and you get the chance to sit and live with it and list and and look at it and then you get real crazy in your old age you start painting and drawing <laughs> <laughs> i mean, I mean how, and, and, which we've and, done and i guess uh, just to sum it up, i just want to you know um what's your guiding light as a collector you know what causes you to buy and maybe what what caused you to buy the pieces that you buy? Like, I mean, I mean that may have changed from earlier on than now, but but do you buy because you like something or are you looking for blue chip, quote unquote, blue chip pieces by established artists? When I started out, uh, I bought what I liked, but also at that time, I wasn't smart enough to know that I had superstars in the collection. Didn't know. I, I talked to George Anamdi uh, recently. He says, Drake, you know what? He says, I didn't, and I, I don't know what this number was. I, I don't even quote the number that he said in the amount of art that he has. But he said that, you know, it was significant. He I said, know Drake, it's significant. I've said, seen it. Yeah, he said, Drake, I, I wasn't buying art because these people were famous or because they had names. He said these people just happen to be famous and have names now. And so his guiding light has always been, do I like it? Is that, it something that I want that's to in, That's important. That's important. But as we matured, as we met appraisers and other art collectors and artists, um, gone online, I've read different books that catalog art and discuss art. We have a lot more knowledge than we did 40 years ago. So yeah, we still want to buy the things we like, but that's not the priority. We want to buy things 
generally that have some aesthetic value because you want to walk through your home and say, oh, ooh, isn't that beautiful? You know, it, it adds something to your environment um, and to your life. Uh, but you also want to have something that is valuable because uh, we want our, our children and our grandchildren to benefit from the collection that we have and from the increase in the collection's value. Gotcha. And, we, and we, we have about 15 minutes uh, left, so I wanna actually get a couple of other okay. collectors up. Uh, now, I'd be remiss to not say this. It wasn't until within the last five to 10 years that we come to understand the art is not just what goes on your wall, the artistry is also what you sit your behind on or what you sit down and eat at. We didn't find that out. Hey, rather like than furniture. like furniture, <laughs> I mean, why would you buy something that devalues instead of something that appreciates? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you. You want to know when they rotate their art? Where do they put them in storage facilities? Yeah, we'll put it in storage, or we'll, or we'll rotate it, you know, in the house. Or if we get we get contemporaries, we get a, a J. Graham. Okay, well, we'll rotate that, and you know, we. Generally, it's in storage. Yeah. We want to make sure that wherever the art is, um, and, it's protected. Thank, thank you all. Thank you all very much. And you know what? In your same building, your building is an art gallery. For, for first of all, I want to say that not just your place, but also I, there's another collector whose place I've visited, and she's the co-chair of the uh, arts uh, committee. So Sharon Gamlin, I want to just invite you up just to say a few words because I think you have a, a, a collection that's just amazing out of this world and uh, amazing. Thank you. Let me have Joan Britton come on up with me. Myself, Sharon Gamblin, and also Joan Britton are the co-chairs for, again, the Church of Wisdom Foundation and Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club auction that's coming up. Um, when I loved art as a child, I can remember going to, people do not know, Romare Bearden was sold at Hudson's. I can remember going to Hudson's with my aunt and I could hear the people around me saying, a thousand, a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars. I didn't have any money as an 11 or 12 year old. My aunt and I were just going to see it. Romare Bearden sells at how much now? Half million. So for me, it, it started pretty early and I've continued to buy art. One of the things that I have done, which Henry mentioned, I've begun to talk to my children more about art, art appreciation. And now I have to laugh when my son is at uh, an art exhibit. He'll usually FaceTime me and say, hey, what do you think about this piece? Or my first question is, as Henry has stated, is that piece signed? If it's not signed, I don't care how much you like it. I'm not buying it. And I'm encouraging you not to buy it. Because if you're passing this on to yourself, if you're keeping it, you don't have any validity of that piece. You don't have any information. And it costs an awful lot to get that information. Over the years, I've continued to buy art. And sometimes people come in and they say, don't you think you have a lot of art? <laughs> and I don't comment because I enjoy it and I've just have always loved the arts. I think I'm like uh, Daphne and Paul and so many people here. I try to buy a little, little smarter. I try to buy what I can afford unless Henry is, you know, giving me some money. So <laughs> even if I buy a like small... <laughs> Even if I'm buying a small, small, small original, opposed to a huge original, I try very hard to buy originals or certainly 
a low edition print, but uh, I have loved the arts for a long time and I continue to love the arts, but Joan is an artist and a collector. Yep. Thank you. Um, we're gonna be ending soon, but before I, I let you all go, we need to really talk about and be excited about September the 18th through the 25th. That's when the art is going to be um, the virtual click bid. So I'm sure if you all go online, Write it down. the and, website. And, and Joan, can they get that through our website as well? The website is www. You got it? Torture Wisdom Foundation Inc. dot com. www. Yes, that's right. It's at the bottom of your flyer. Yeah, please, and before you leave, please grab some flyers. And you know what? When you do get this information, and the ones of you who are uh, in contact with us online, please share it. You know, just share it. You you don't even have to put a comment on it. I mean, if we would like a comment. But if you just share it, that will be a big help. Now, also, during that course of the week, 18th through the 25th, you can bid all day, all night, okay? But now, out of those uh, pictures that you will see online, we will have an actual live auction of 15 of those items. And they'll be right here in this room for the auction. You want to be here. Because it's going to be absolutely beautiful. The artwork this year is unbelievable. And for those I've who are starting, my for it. huh? I've saved up all my nickels. <laughs> you share. You share. <laughs> well, the thing about it, if you are saying, "Well, I can't afford a lot of work," there are pieces online. You'll be able to afford it. You see a piece, three, four hundred dollars, a hundred. There's some pieces that are low as a hundred dollars. So during the course of the week, if you're bidding and you see something that you want, just watch for it and keep continuing to bid. To bid. And if it comes out of range, go look at another piece of artwork. That's how you really get good, good art. Because all, all of it has and been curated. Really quickly, we I, I want to do uh, a couple of micro moments and thank you, Joan. Thank you. And, Joan and Sharon, thank you all very much. Uh, I want there's one other collector I want to invite up, and also Mayor, I want to put you on the spot uh, to talk really briefly about some of the creative things that are going on in Southfield. But Yolanda, Yolanda, the Thurfield, yeah, I'm putting you on the spot, Yolanda. <laughs> As an emerging collector, I know that you have acquired some pieces that we've talked about in recent years, and I just want to just have you just, just Share your passion and your purple, your purple passion. <laughs> yeah, we, uh -huh. Henry spotted you. Yes. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Yolanda Durfield, and uh, very excited. This is the fifth year that we're doing this annual uh, art extravaganza, and it's really actually when I started my art collection, thanks to dear Henry over here. Yeah, you had something to do with it. Uh, but again, for those who are, you know, you might have been doing your shopping at TJ Maxx or Home Goods for your artwork when maybe you purchased your new home or what have you. And it has really been a great experience for me as a newer collector. Um, I really started paying very close attention to all the tips that have been given here today. And now I'm even here because I recognize I need to do more about ensuring my art. I have really expanded my collection, exactly what Joan said. I'll start online just looking at some of the hundred dollar pieces, some of the smaller pieces. And, you know, I'm starting to realize there's a few collectors in the room that have similar tastes that I have. So I get into a bidding war with them during that, that time. But again, it's a great way if you don't know how to start, start small, start looking for the artists as they sign their work. I don't buy any work if they're, if they're not signed and I expect it on the front. I even asked for a certificate of authenticity as they, all, all this advice is great advice if you're trying to get started. And I'm teaching my children. I have teen children and I'm teaching them the value in art as well. So. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. Uh, Mark, 
can is this going to cut off online or can we keep it going does it go off when we go off okay thank you thank you okay all right i have uh here uh mayor cyber and miss dolores flag i am um, am excited to have you just i know there's a lot of you know what southfield has been known as a sleepy town for a lot of a lot of time a long time but you're you have some things that are, that you know that are in the hopper that are occurring in this community here that the torch of wisdom is going to be uh, benefiting from. But just can you just talk about how the arts are interfacing with some of the upcoming developments of the city and and how important that is to uh, what's going to be going on? Well, good afternoon. I'm with Dolores Flagg, who's uh, chair of the South of Public Arts Commission. Um, we have a great commission, it's 11 members, um, and we're, we're doing lots of things. Um, currently, uh, we, uh, we're rotating a local artists through the, in the lobby of Southfield City Hall, roughly three, four months for every, every exhibit. Uh, right now, um, uh, we have uh, Carol Isant, uh, and we have um, Priscilla Pfeiffer, Soror, um, their work. Um, uh, we're still working, uh, and thanks to the introduction of Henry uh, with um, uh, our, uh, God, I don't know what's going on. Uh, um, no. <laughs> um, Northwestern Highway. Um, uh, Henry. Help me out. Uh, I'm just doing a total blank. Uh, no. Um, Herbert Massey. I don't know. Jeez. Uh, sorry, so sorry. Um, uh, her, yeah. You introduced us. Uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> um, anyhow, Herbert Massey has uh, done um, a series of panels on Northwestern Highway along. Um, uh, the uh, campus of LTU, we're, um, you know, we've added almost 20 miles of pathways in Southwood. We're trying to make the city more walkable, but it's not just about walking. It's about exper the experience while you're, while you're going along. Um, and then uh, very soon, uh, uh, Herbert tells me that we will have the obelisk uh, on 11 mile just east of the post office. Uh, where uh, the highway kind of bends, uh, there's a nice grassy area. Um, and we're also, um, our, our next major initiative is going to be, um, uh, we're working with all the uh, Southern Oakland County communities from Hazel Park, Ferndale, Oak Park, uh, Southfield, then over as far as Novi on a nine mile corridor that recreation and, and placemaking and connectivity corridor. And so uh, I did speak to, uh, at the anniversary of um, the torch, or the, the, the mortgage burning, rather, um, our first phase is from Losher to Greenfield. And um, I have um, a, we don't, we don't quite have it yet, but uh, a major installation on the corner of Southville Road uh, or South of Service Drive and Nine Mile uh, and the um, Kenmar building. Um, um, and we'll be adding art along, along the way as well as if you go down this way towards Barbara Woods, you can see one of our projects. We're adding sidewalks for half a mile. Um, and what we're hoping to do, it, um, we will eventually be connected from Alasher all the way down to Northland. Uh, with uh, with trails, uh, we're adding every year. We're adding. We've gotten grants. We're adding more, more, and more sidewalk, and then it's not not just about again. It's not about sidewalk. It's about um, uh, uh, the the place making that that goes with it. Well, first and foremost, I wanted to thank the panel. Uh, uh, to be educated is always a welcome. Uh, and certainly, as I look in the audience, I see so many of my friends that church members and artists that we stop and talk after church. Loretta Brown was one of them. 
at Tolkien United Methodist Church. So let me just fast forward because first and foremost, this is very filling for me. Not only aesthetically to hear from the artists in the community, but also as an artist myself, as an art educator, you know, for 38 plus, plus, plus years. But nonetheless, it is important that you get educated. One of the things that the mayor um, did not mention, and that is we receive and welcome all artists. Our first step was to have our first art exhibition in the city of Southfield. We, our arms are open for artists. And I know you mentioned something early about the city metropolitan area cities need to get more involved and in initiating more contact interaction with the artists in their communities, let alone the ones that are out in the metropolitan area surrounding them. So we, Southfield, welcome all artists. Our first artist was John Osler. I don't know if any of you know John Osler. Yes. 89 some years old. I met him at an event. I said one word and he said the other word and that was art. And that was the connection. He was our first artist to exhibit at the city of Southfield. He is the very first to really make a statement, not only for him as an artist, but other artists in the metropolitan areas. Don't be afraid to just to stay in one location because I heard some artists say, well, I like to stay in Detroit. No, venture out. You know, sometimes you have to go outside your neighborhood to be recognized, to be appreciated. So we're saying to you, we invite all artists, open arms, your artistry to the nth level to come to Southfield. But right now we've got the two artists as he indicated earlier, um, uh, um, Pfeiffer as well as Isaac. And you know, we, we connect, uh, he didn't say, tell you, but Drake and I worked at the Charles Wright Museum and that's how we connected. And we've been friends and when he, I told his mother was going to be one of the artists, he jumped, yeah. <laughs> but at any rate, once again, you know, at the risk of not being long-winded, I just wanna say thank you for the panelists. Thank you for educating me and all of you. Uh, we want to showcase the arts, the artists in Southfield. So we welcome you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Man, the passion is palpable. I like that word. I like it too. I just wanna say thank you to the panelists, the panelists, that, the unexpected panelists, as well as the invited panelists. <laughs> One more and thing. and uh, please just, you know, we'll have some, we, we'll close up with some closing words from all of you. So, Catherine. Um, I guess I'll go first. Um, and those bags, you guys have like a little paper packet as well. That front sheet, if you can at least put your name, your um, email address or phone number, we're going to go ahead and do a drawing. That way we can at least make sure we do our part to make sure we give those gift bags away in the back. So make sure you fill out the paper because you'll get a, a new car. <laughs> We're a little too soon for that I'm one. Sorry, but... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'll just say, we're, we are happy to answer any questions at any point in time. If there's anything that we can ever do from an insurance perspective, please feel free to reach out. Our contact information is in there. And we are really thankful. Thank you for allowing us to come. The education really is important to people. Lots of, lots of people don't understand, so I'm glad. Thank you for, for allowing Thank us to you. be here and everyone here. Thank you. Huh? And yes. um, thank you so much for having me on this uh, panel. It's been a uh, pleasure and a privilege uh, basically just to share um, my experience with collecting art and I feel like I am not only uh, a collector of art, but also a beholder of history and stories and also fortune. And last but not least, every Monday at five o'clock, <laughs> put it in your notes, at Mary Grove College campus, now called the Conservancy because uh, Kresge Foundation put $75 million in that to turn into a big art center. And Hubert Massey's studio is there also. So in the courtyard, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow, but in the courtyard we have, and if it does rain, they got these huge rooms we go into. And you bring a couple of pieces to show and tell. I give you two minutes. If you talk over two minutes, I'm gonna ring your bell or my bell and um, and and uh, show your work. So tomorrow at five o'clock, 
Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club meet every Monday, five o'clock. So come on down, enjoy yourself. Food is available uh, and also drink. Do not bring your Subway sandwiches because they have a, uh, I had to tell some people that they showed up with some chicken. And I told them that uh, they don't, you know, don't do that, whatever you do. All I tried to do in life was to make art democratic because regular folks didn't know about art. The people that own the Somerset Mall have their own art museum. And museums are chasing them because they want their collection and their museums. So let's take art to another level. Let's spread the news. Let's tell our young people, because they're buying tennis shoes and, and uh, all that kind of stuff, about the value of learn, learn about art, because it's really important. And everybody register back there so, some, so somebody in this room will drive home with a new bag of whatever they got. And, and, and I want to let's, let's give our panelists another round of applause. Let's give yourselves a round of applause for being the sophisticated artists, artisans, and collectors that you all are, and uh, and, and contributing to a cause that's that's going to uh, go way beyond uh, our lives here, and that is the uh, preservation of the culture and the continuation of it into the future by collecting art. We are transmitting ourselves, our thoughts and ideas and our culture into the future. And let's keep it up. There is a raffle that is going to occur after the people, sorry for the folks that are watching online. You won't be able to participate, but the folks in this room can participate in, a, I was told, in, in the raffle. And you and, can't win if you're not here. That's right. <laughs> and so, and Aaron, are you taking information about the raffle around, or where is that occurring? How is that occurring? Well, he's collecting Aaron's, it. He's collecting the worksheets, that first worksheet okay. in your packet. And I'll run up there one as soon as we're okay. done and get the gift. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, in Stick and Stay, thank you very much for coming out today. And September 18th through what? Right there. I, I know you know. <laughs> <laughs> September 18th through the 25th. What's going on on September 18th through the 25th, everybody? And, and what are we going to do when we see this online? And what are we going to do when we leave here today? We're, <laughs> we're going to grab some of these and we're going to give, we're going to just, just take, just take five of them. I'm not making it difficult. And, and make certain you give five of them to your friends, people who might not otherwise come but who you know will be interested. Thank you all again.